Hola, bona tarda, bones tardes. Benvinguts al CSSB, benvinguts a la primera de les sessions del cicle Mart, l'última frontera. El meu nom és Mendiu José Luis de Vicente, soc un col·laborador habitual del CSSB. I tenim un invitat de luxe avui per parlar de tot el escenari, tot l'imaginari entorn al qual aquesta exposició gira, que té a veure molt directament amb els nostres desigs, els nostres somnes, les nostres esperances posats en el nostre planeta germà, d'alguna manera, a Mart. Quería, antes que nada, contar algunas cosas para los que probablemente todavía no hayáis tenido la oportunidad de ver la exposición. Eh, yo tuve la suerte de verla hace un par de días y es una exposición excepcional en la mejor tradición de las exposiciones de CCCB que son capaces de mirar a lo histórico, lo científico, lo político y lo cultural como eh, un prisma de muchas caras. Eh, si la exposición habla de eh, un planeta al que estamos unidos de distintas maneras, es porque en el mundo de 2021, de alguna forma, a Marte representa muchas cosas. La exposición se llama Marte, el espejo rojo, y es porque Marte ha sido, a lo largo de nuestra cultura, ya no conocemos esa historia, una posibilidad. La posibilidad de imaginar que si empezáramos de otra forma, en otro sitio, cuál sería ese sitio y cómo sería esa otra forma de empezar. Cómo podríamos arreglar o superar muchas de las limitaciones que tenemos en el planeta Tierra, muchos de los problemas que no hemos sabido cómo arreglar. De alguna manera, la exposición, y me parece que es muy interesante, es una historia cultural de Marte. No deja de ser una paradoja que podamos hablar de que Marte, a pesar de ser un lugar que nunca hemos pisado, que está en el menor de los casos a 50 y algo millones de kilómetros, y más habitualmente a cerca de 200 millones de kilómetros, pues es un lugar con una historia humana. No estamos ahí, pero a lo largo de toda la historia de la humanidad, Marte ha representado y ha simbolizado distintas cosas. Y en, particularmente en los últimos 200 años ha significado la posibilidad del otro, de lo que tenemos en común con el otro y de cómo somos distintos a él, la posibilidad, como decía, de empezar de nuevo, la posibilidad de imaginar que hay otras sociedades posibles eh, y el marciano representa de alguna forma el que nos es extraño, el que no somos nosotros, pero el que de alguna manera por su existencia nos hace preguntarnos también o nos confronta con, con qué es la esencia de lo humano. Uh, Marte hoy es varias cosas y me gustan esos tres conceptos que la exposición y que este ciclo toca de distintas maneras. Una es frontera y frontera entendido en un momento en que de alguna manera hemos heredado todo el peso del colonialismo, que seguir explorando más Marte es la posibilidad de continuar o de rechazar determinados discursos de la colonización y de la conquista. Toda la historia cultural de Marte, de nuestros relatos sobre Marte, está muy directamente relacionada con estas ideas de colonización y de conquista. Que Marte es un espejo, como dice el título de la exposición y como dice eh, una línea eh, eh, en uno de los libros más importantes de nuestro invitado hoy. Y que Marte es o no es, tenemos la tentación de pensar que es la única candidata, la única posibilidad de tener lo que el movimiento ecologista siempre ha llamado un planeta B. Un planeta B como un plan B ante la posibilidad de que o bien la vida en la Tierra siga, deje de ser viable, deje de ser factible, que la dimensión de nuestros problemas no supere hasta esta, hasta esta uh, imposibilidad de continuar en ello, pero también que hay un cierto imperativo moral a que la humanidad abandone su cuna, abandone su, su casa, la Tierra, y se extienda en otros eh, planetas. En unos tiempos de crisis eh, sistémicas a escala planetaria como estos, la posibilidad de un planeta B es siempre una idea tentadora, pensar que que quizás podemos arreglar de alguna manera todos los problemas de nuestra sociedad fundando una sociedad nueva. Pero de alguna manera una idea que flota sobre nuestro pensamiento hoy sobre Marte, ya sea desde los nuevos discursos de la privatización de la carrera espacial y la mezcla de pensar en un mundo cada vez más desigual, donde algunos nos quedamos aquí con unos problemas que no sabemos cómo afrontar mientras otros pueden abandonarnos a fundar una sociedad nueva en un planeta. De alguna manera la idea que flota uh, de alguna forma es que eh, parece más fácil pensar o imaginar, parafraseando la famosa frase, eh, un mundo nuevo en Marte que un mundo nuevo en la Tierra. Y creo que estas son algunas de las cosas que vamos a poder eh, hablar hoy. Evidentemente hoy no es 
cualquier momento, estamos en febrero de 2021, en tiempos de crisis planetaria y en tiempos de eh, exploración extraplanetaria. Para poner un poco un marco a este momento, en las últimas semanas tres distintas naves han llegado a la órbita de Marte, no solo el Perseverance, la, la más conocida, la que hemos oído hablar, pero también eh, un orbi, un, una nave orbital china y otra de los Emiratos Árabes. Esto es así porque es el momento en que los dos planetas se encuentran más cercanos. Eh, y no podemos obviar que evidentemente esto está pasando en el momento de crisis planetaria a, a una escala sin precedentes para todos los que estamos vivos, para todos los humanos del planeta. Eh, vamos a Marte para buscar pruebas de que hay bacterias vivas o que hubo alguna vez bacterias vivas en Marte, pero también eh, mientras intentamos entender cómo nuestra interrelación con una forma bacterial, con, con un virus, ha cambiado el mundo y ha cambiado nuestras vidas de una manera muy directa y de una manera eh, dramática a, a todos los niveles. Vamos a Marte también para ver si somos capaces de, en uno de los experimentos más importantes de Perseverance, a extraer CO2 de, de su atmósfera y transformarlo en oxígeno. Empezando así la lógica extractiva, la lógica extractivista, que de alguna manera nos ha llevado a donde hemos estado, a donde estamos hoy en esos tiempos de, de crisis planetaria. Uh, creo que esta exposición y este ciclo hablan de cómo pensamos y cómo aprendemos a pensar en escalas planetarias en un momento de crisis con escalas planetarias. Y es un lujo que de todo esto vayamos a poder hablar hoy con uno de los escritores más respetados del mundo hablando de la interrelación entre eh, ciencia, tecnología, política y nuevas utopías con el creador de una obra maestra en la literatura marciana. Eh, Kim Stanley Robinson es un escritor de ciencia ficción norteamericano. Eh, este año, el año pasado, de hecho, en 2020, publicó su veinteava novela. Eh, su eh, obra se ha, trabajado a, se, ha, se ha traducido a muchísimos idiomas, se ha ganado todos los premios importantes en su ámbito, desde el Nebula, el Hugo, eh, y, de alguna manera, pertenece a una generación de escritores de ciencia ficción que han roto el techo, han roto los marcos de esta forma considerada hasta no hace demasiado como un género que, de alguna manera, no podía tomarse con la misma seriedad o, o, o con el mismo interés que, que la llamada ficción literaria. Eh, las novelas de Kim Stanley Robinson han tenido una influencia muy importante sobre la generación no solo de novelistas y escritores, sino también de filósofos de nuestro tiempo, uh, solo por explicar un poco el momento en el que creo que le encuentra después de una carrera tan larga. Eh, su último libro, El misterio del futuro, The Ministry of the Future, uh, es probablemente eh, la obra que más impacto ha generado fuera del ámbito de la ciencia ficción, escrita por Kim Stanley Robinson. Solo por dar un par de datos, eh, Barack Obama lo colocó en su influente, muy influyente lista de libros favoritos de 2020. Y Ezra Klein, uno de los columnistas estrella del New York Times, dijo sobre este libro, que es un libro que todos los políticos, que si hay un libro que todos los políticos deberían de haber leído, publicado en 2020, es este libro, El Ministerio del Futuro, del que hablaremos a continuación. Pero probablemente eh, la conexión más importante con esta exposición es que Kim Stanley Robinson es el autor de una trilogía fundamental eh, que empieza a publicarse en un año muy especial, 1992. 1992, año olímpico, año de transformación de, de esta ciudad. Es el año en que se publica un título de ciencia ficción que en ese momento eh, de un escritor desconocido no, no se espera de alguna manera o no, o no ha generado todavía una gran sensación de expectativa. 1992 creo que es otro hito que, marca, que es importante también marcar, es el, el año de la primera conferencia climática, la conferencia de Río. Es de alguna manera la primera escenificación de reconocimiento de un tema que es el gran tema en la obra de Krim Stanley Robinson, las implicaciones de cómo transformar nuestra sociedad a partir de una crisis que nos supera por completo, la crisis climática y su relación con la crisis de biodiversidad. Y en eh, Marte Rojo, Marte Verde y Marte Azul, que es, como vimos, una aportación fundamental al pensamiento literario sobre Marte, Kim Stanley Robinson cuenta la historia de la eh, conquista, colonización y terraformación del planeta Marte, es decir, de su transformación en un planeta habitable. Y cómo este gran proyecto de eh, ingeniería planetaria a gran escala en realidad es un experimento político que le da todo el peso de todos los experimentos de utopías políticas a lo largo de toda la historia humana y que de alguna manera ahonda en nuestra relación con cómo lo geológico y lo político se ven entrelazados. 
Eh, me gusta a mí siempre pensar que en 1992, cuando Kim Estadio sobre escrita este libro, estamos todavía a ocho años de acuñar un concepto, un término, que durante un tiempo ha sido de alguna manera el término definitorio de las primeras dos décadas de este siglo, eh, la idea del antropoceno, la idea de que la acción humana es el principal eh, factor de transformación geológica de la base del planeta. De alguna manera, eh, Marte Rojo, Marte Verde y Marte Azul anticipan la idea del antropoceno como un agente eh, político, geológico, que implica estas dos dimensiones de manera fundamental. Eh, creo que es un enorme placer y es un lujo eh, arrancar este ciclo e inaugurar esta exposición con Kim Stanley Robinson. Kim Stanley Robinson, are you with us? Hello. Can you hear us? I am. Thanks for joining yes. us. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I, I have so many things that I actually wanted to, to ask you about. So I'm going to try to be a little bit organized. Uh, because there's so much that I would like to cover about your body of work, but about your thinking about the world today. Uh, I feel, and, and I was thinking in a way of starting this conversation, that seeing the world from the vantage point of February 2021, the world has a certain Robinsonian quality to it, if you ask me. I don't exactly know what is the adjective to define the feel of a world that is very much relatable by the readers of your work, you know, so we've said, Lin Chang or Ballardia many times. I'm happy to, to say Kim Stanley Robinsonian in public for the very first time, maybe, because so the state of the world today is that this month, three different man-made probes and orbiters made it to Mars, not only Perseverance, of course, the most well-known, but also two other ones from China and the Arab Emirates. And this is happening in a world that is still traumatized by an event Uh, of such magnitude that no one alive today probably had experienced it before. A collective experience that has touched the lives of every human, single human being in the planet, the pandemic. Uh, many of the foundations of capitalism still remain grinded to a halt. It's one year later, still no tourism. Uh, but at the same time, we have witnessed in this 12 months period incredible scientific feats. The development of the RNA vaccines in less than a year, which feels like an unprecedented success and something that may have very big implications for the future. Uh, but still, even they have mostly followed the logic of the market and competition in their development. The vaccines are free to citizens, but remain tightly controlled by corporations, and they are being distributed among countries very much following the logic of the current global order, you know? We are not finding, in a way, a political utopia as a mechanism to distribute the vaccines in ways that also change the political order. Uh, to me, like this tension between huge dramatic challenges with terrible consequences and the capacity of humans to uh, overcome with their will and imagination, this huge crisis feels to me very much the quality of living in a Kim Stanley Robinson world. And I was thinking in a piece that you wrote in the middle of the first wave of the pandemic, in May, when we were all still stuck at home, so it was very much welcome, you know, because we really needed <laughs> to receive thinking about what was happening to all of us. Uh, you said that this crisis had shown how much and how quickly we can change as a civilization. And this optimism is also one central quality in a Kim Stanley Robinson world. So my first question for you today, and I wanted to open is, one year later after this crisis started, yesterday we were celebrating, well, commemorating one year of the first identified cases of coronavirus in Barcelona. Uh, what are your impressions of the state of the world as of now? Uh, this world of planetary crisis, but also of RNA vaccines, of the arrival of the perseverance into Mars to look for possible traces of life. And do you still feel there is a window of opportunity for changing quickly and changing a lot? Uh, well, thank you for that. And I certainly hope there is. It's a funny thought um, that now that we have a pandemic, that it's a, a, like a Kim Stanley Robinson novel. But uh, I think what you mean and what I would want to take out of that is a larger sense that we are in a science fiction novel that we are all writing together. Um, and what I mean uh, when I say that is that we now know that we're a single global civilization and something that happens on the other side of the earth can change your life the following week in drastic ways. Um, we also have seen that, as you pointed out, the scientific response has been 
tremendous. It's been coordinated, international, fast and effective, and also not done for profit, but for saving people's lives. Then you, we've also seen that the social response of compliance with government um, orders to behave in different ways has been pretty good, pretty comprehensive. It's, it's proof that when people are scared, they hang together and uh, do what's necessary as decided in a, um, a kind of representative way by governments to uh, behave in ways that make things safer for us. Obviously, fear is a factor in that, but also you can't uh, deny that the level of cooperation has been intense. Uh, and then, but lastly, and you also pointed this out, it's the economic system that has been rigid and slow, that has not forgiven all debts for this last year, that has continued to um, uh, charge rents to, to, people have both lost jobs and also been required to continue to pay rent. The, the, the fact that money is a social creation also, uh, backed by governments, but um, a method of social cooperation, and yet it yokes us to a kind of servitude in our minds of debt itself. And uh, that didn't change in a ways that it obviously should have to adjust to the crisis. So it's a really a diagnostic. It's, a, it's been like a stress test for civilization. And some parts of the civilization have responded to the stress really well. And other parts having to do with um, power and um, inequality and injustice, they have not responded in the same way. So uh, more pressure is going to have to be brought to bear on that front, I think. Actually, I was trying not to make this kind of argument that always, I'm, I'm sure that you have to face this argument all the time. Last year felt like a science fiction novel because this is a bit of like a commonplace. But I was meaning exactly, and you define it here very well, those three layers in a way that we can have, uh, we can have planetary scale apocalyptic disasters overlap with scientific and technological revolutions, overlap with the desire for political economic manifestations and, and, and radical transformations. And I think those three layers tend to be entangled in multiple ways in your work. Uh, and the way that you, the diagnostic, diagnostic that you just made was very clear because the fact that we could develop vaccines through mechanisms and in a way that we had never ever achieved before, I, I still remember how at the beginning of the pandemic, the, 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 there was like this big, huge red sign saying, the shortest time spanning which we have ever developed a vaccine is four years. So hold mm -hmm. on tight, you know, because the, we're going to try something unprecedented here. And we can do something unprecedented on the scientific level. And actually, right now the world feels that it'll be like a real time experiment because there is so much that we don't know about how these vaccines will work, what will be their degree of success. Th there is. Uh, a little bit of a feeling of the whole world is a laboratory right now, as Bruno Latour would say. Uh, but at the same time, the economic system remains absolutely rigid. Like it seems that it becomes so difficult to actually dismount, dismantle some of those uh, uh, elements that seem tougher than geology in a way. So actually, uh, I don't want to find for a solution. I know there is not a solution there, but a lot of your work has been about thinking about ways of dismantling it and ways of actually producing uh, economic model alternatives at the same time that we are imagining uh, scientific and technological alternatives. Uh, do you still feel that we are running an experiment right now also in that order that we may be able to learn from, that we may be able to, to actually uh, uh, make faster changes that we really desperately need in that domain? I think we are because we are in a nation state system. Hmm. So biologically, we are in a single biosphere and a single civilization as a single species. But politically, we live in a nation state system where each nation state has taken a different approach to dealing with the pandemic. And sometimes it's a almost brutal laboratory experiment where um, say two countries very much alike like Sweden and Norway 
will take uh, quite different approaches to dealing with the pandemic. And then you can simply track the death rate and see which system has worked better. You see uh, huge differences in big countries so that uh, China, uh, India, United States, Brazil have made uh, different approaches to the pandemic. A country like Indonesia has given the vaccine to all the young people first because they need to, they're the essential workers. And if they don't get sick, then they don't make the old people sick. Other countries have um, given the vaccine to the old people because they're the ones most likely to die. So you see political decisions with life and death repercussions that don't have to do with warfare, but with our own um, natural worlds, uh, 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 throwing up diseases that will be more and more prevalent the more we damage the biosphere. So yes, this year has been an extraordinary lesson. And one of the things that I've been saying my whole career, that science in our civilization, the scientific enterprise, which means all the institutions, science, technology, engineering, mathematics and medicine, and it's crucial now to remember medicine as a science, that this has been an already existing utopian experiment, that this is also part of government, that we can't live without science, that, it, that in other words, um, uh, 8 billion people alive on this planet at once is a scientific and technological achievement. It's not natural if we didn't have our scientific support systems, the planet might support more like 1 billion people instead of 8 billion. So we're on the tip of a tower that we've built that all has to work for us all to survive. And um, you know, it's a, it's a curious paradox because it's scientific achievements that has created this large human population with all of its powers. But then um, problems have erupted from that success. And now we've got uh, subsequent problems that only science can get us out of. So we're deep into a process of history that um, we can only go forward, not backwards. Let's go to Mars, which was the starting point of our travel today. I have an image here. I don't know if we can put it from here. Uh, I'm quite fascinated by the idea that this picture that I have in my computer, and I don't know if we can get it up on screen, uh, was taken a couple days ago, 50 million kilometers from here. ¿Podemos poner las imágenes arriba o no podemos? Gracias. Uh, so yeah, of course, this is Perseverance, and Perseverance uh, arrived a few days uh, ago to the surface of Mars. Um, it is quite uh, impressive to think, in a way, that the most complex uh, measuring laboratory that we ever uh, develop and send to another uh, planet is already there, and is starting to send information. And uh, as a reader of your work, I remember very vividly that the first thing that impressed me when I read, read Mars was suddenly understanding that Mars is not an alien world. Uh, we have never, no human has ever stepped a foot there, but this is a place that we know very, very well, to the point that we could describe every mountain, every valley, because they have names. We know its surface intimately, you know, this is a place uh, which surface is as, as big as the Earth, if we take out the oceans, but we know it very, very well. And we've known it very well not for so long. And you were there, and you were already thinking about this at the beginning when we started knowing it, you know? Uh, your personal trip starts to Mars starts in 1975 when Viking lands in Mars, the first spacecraft to do so. And then the information gathered by the first Martian landers and orbiters ends up producing a book, which is this one, The Surface of Mars, published in 1981, that you get to study in deep detail. Uh, this becomes the Bible of the science of studying Mars and understanding the surface of Mars, aerology, as you call it, for a long time. Uh, here you can see Olympus Mons, which is the highest mountain in the solar system. It's Mars Everest. Now they say it's the second, actually. Um, it's not clear to me. Uh, you've written about this, so my question was, what do you remember about this moment? What did Mars meant in the end of the 70s, early 80s, to a literature student working on their PhD who was interested in the leftist political tradition, and how do you become fascinated by this notion that you call aerology, the study of the geology of Mars? 
Well, it was an extraordinary thing. I was interested in science fiction um, just a few years before Viking landed. I had discovered science fiction as a literature student coming from Southern California, which is a, a region much like Barcelona, but facing the other direction, um, had been changed from agriculture to urban in um, 10 years or less. And so when I discovered science fiction, it was a big shock of recognition that this was my literature, this described reality that I knew better than any other form of literature. And then suddenly Viking gave us Mars. And what was interesting to me was Mars was at this point, both real and empty. And it was real in the sense that the Viking photos, although they're um, ridiculously bad compared to the ones from Perseverance, they were way better than anything that had existed before, like millions of times better. So we had this real place. It, it, on its surface, it looked like um, the American West deserts. Um, and it had water and it was, so it was real, but it was empty. So with my interest in uh, leftist utopias coming out of Le Guin's Dispossessed and other utopian literature from, that was very exciting in my time in the 1970s, I naturally, it's like your exhibit says, Mars is a red mirror. It's a, a space in which you could imagine different society developing based on scientific principles somewhat from scratch with the attempt to um, figure out a way to make more equality and sustainability on a, a very harsh and unforgiving world where we would actually have to make the biosphere as well as the civilization. So uh, for, first and most importantly, it made an interesting topic for a novel and as a novelist, I wanted to uh, give it a try. It, it took me 10 years to get from the initial realization of wanting to do a Mars novel to even beginning, and then another seven years after that to write the book. Uh, actually, something that always called my attention in a way is that you start writing the book in 1989. And actually, uh, you say in, in, in the text that you wrote for the exhibition that in September 1989, so couple of months later, the wall changes very dramatically. The, the Berlin Wall falls and, and, and one of the big superpowers, the Eastern Bloc, collapses in a way closing one historical cycle but opening up also the cycle of neoliberalism. Uh, mm. It's also to me, uh, and I said in the opening, kind of like a striking and also uh, important that the year that Red Mars is published is the year of the first climate conference, is the year of the Rio uh, conference. So it's also the beginning of a political cycle that will take more than 25 years in a way to reach its conclusion in terms of realizing the scale of what was happening there. Uh, Bruno Latour talks about, and I, and I like this idea, geopolitics as being a term that means something very different today than what it could mean originally, right? It's like this entanglement between uh, the politics of the earth and the politics of the, of the economic systems and political economic systems that have built one specific feeling of the world. Uh, you're a product of leftist critical tradition, but also of the literary tradition of science fiction. And, and what, at the place in which they both overlap, right, is utopia, right? Scientific utopia, science fiction utopias and political utopias somehow involve the capacity of imagining other worlds and other ways of living. How do you kind of like arrive at that, you know, point of crossing? Because I, I think it's one of the things that of course makes your trilogy very, very important. The idea that, that the science fiction utopia and the political utopia find one common ground in the process of geological transformation of a planet, right in the moment when we are starting to get the first signs that the, that the geological transformation through a political model of a planet is happening, it is what we are doing, and it's going to have big consequences down the road. So again, how do you remember that mingling for you and the way that you're thinking, your training in, in political traditions and in science fiction and utopian traditions? And, and, and and how do they actually give, give shape to what the, the Mars trilogy ends up being? Sure. Mm -hmm. It was a complicated procedure because my education had been in what you might call uh, eco-Marxism. Uh, my professor was Frederick Jameson and the, the um, 
neo-Marxist uh, critical tradition, uh, particularly Western Europe uh, and um, uh, in France and the rest of Europe was a part of my education. And then at the same time, I was pursuing the planetologists studying the solar system, including Carl Sagan, very importantly, the combination of uh, the solar system being given to us in tangible form by Viking, but also by Voyager going through the outer planets, inspired him and a group of scientists working with him to talk about terraforming. And this is sort of the eco in eco-Marxism. The classical socialist tradition, like capitalism itself, tended to regard the natural world as an externality that was more or less infinite in its um, uh, usefulness to humans that we could continue to exploit it as much as we had the power to do so and that it would never run out that there were no negative consequences and that um, if in effect it was it was like an infinite resource well it was planetary thinking and really the shot of earth from the moon uh, with the orbiter uh, back in the Apollo days that made it clearer than ever that this one planet is not that huge given the growing population and technical powers and desire for resources of human civilization. So all these things came together and also 1989, the, the fall of the Soviet Union, it meant that um, there were a lot of velvet revolutions, so-called uh, overturnings of political orders without violent mass death, without revolution in the form of say the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or um, the Spanish Civil War of uh, 35, 36. I mean, Barcelona itself is a place that's seen guns in the street and blood in the streets. And yet in 89, some of these revolutions were simply by masses of people showing up in the streets and demanding new governments, which then uh, came forth because of the collapse of an imperial power, the Soviet Union. Well, this was very suggestive that maybe there could be scientific revolutions that were also political revolutions that didn't require a violent, bloody uh, revolt. And uh, I will point out, it was a pleasant surprise to me that when the Mars Trilogy was being published through the 90s, they were instantly being translated in Eastern Europe and read widely in Poland, Hungary, Czech, Slovakia, uh, and also on both sides of the Serbo-Croatian war, they were reading the Mars Trilogy, I think, to try to find hope in a time of stupendous political upheaval and hoping that maybe it could come to some good result, hoping that good things could happen without intense violence, etc. Now, you pointed it out. At the same time, the neoliberal order was um, getting locked into place. That began in 1980 with Reagan and Thatcher. And at first it wasn't clear what was going on. The dispossession of more and more of people's property extracted and appropriated by um, the wealthiest people on the planet in an international civilization uh, that got called globalization. And then when it was the planet was included that got called the Anthropocene. Well, all of this is, um, all of these stew of historical forces are precisely uh, modeled in miniature by the Martian problem. Oh, you have to take care of your atmosphere. Oh, you actually have to make your oceans and then you have to keep them healthy by a management process. On Mars, you call it terraformation. On Earth, we call it geoengineering. And we are doing it here in a gigantic scale and the stakes are so much higher here we only really have the one planet mars is not a planet b uh, you, we can't live there it's a modeling exercise only so with the stakes as high as they are what mars serves then as is a kind of a thought experiment or an inspiration uh, actually something that i think also is important in the trilogy uh, I was saying in the introduction that this exhibition that we've just opened is really an exhibition on a cultural history of Mars. Like Mars is a place that we've never gone to, but that it definitely, you can build a human history of Mars. 
that is very, very well reflected in the trilogy. Like, it feels like the first time that you had to do to write is write your own uh, cultural history of Mars and place some placeholders there in one way or another. For instance, of course, yours uh, is not the first novel that uses Mars as a political utopia. So also, do you have to build your own, at the same time that you were looking at the surface pictures of Mars, your own cultural history of Mars? And do you think that is there like a definitive one or like you had to like highlight those aspects that were useful for you to try to do the modeling exercise that you were doing? Like how did you build your own personal cultural history of Mars for the trilogy? Well, it was relatively easy. It's a small body of literature and it's mostly begun with uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli in the um, late 19th century um, looking through telescopes that were just good enough to show some color changes in the Martian surface. Enough to make it look like there was a vegetable life that having a seasonal growth and degrowth. And then there were lines in the view that he called canali, and in Italian means channels. In English, it was translated as canals. And Percival Lowell, the American astronomer, um, hallucinated a complete system of canals. And it was then v very widely believed that there were Martians alive on Mars, intelligent enough and organized enough to build canals because their planet was drying out, being further from the sun. Well, this inspired um, H.G. Wells and then in Russia, the um, Arkady, uh, or Alexander Bogdanov, um, and also Karl Lazowitz in Germany. Uh, these were interesting utopias for the Russian and the German, a dystopia for the British, a, a critique of British empire. In America, um, Edgar Rice Burroughs and the, the silly craziness of John Carter on Mars, just a, a silly adventures. And so the, the national styles were somewhat revealed in a funny way. But what I want to impress upon you is that the science fiction writers were always attuned to the scientists. So in the 1930s, the scientists were uh, beginning to see that there was no atmosphere on Mars, not, or it was so thin it had no oxygen. There was no visible water in the spectroscopes. So this is why Ray Bradbury and Arthur C. Clarke, they wrote about Mars as a dry place, as a place where uh, if there was a civilization as Bradbury wrote so beautifully, they were ghosts. They were maybe even images from our imaginations that we had projected out there. And so Mars was indeed occupied by a living intelligence, but it was human beings trying to make a space livable that turned out not to be livable. This was the great achievement of 1950s science fiction views of Mars and not much changed in that. Philip K. Dick was part of that um, and D.G. Compton. But then you get Viking. And then two things happened. Indeed, it is dry. Indeed, it doesn't have an atmosphere, but there's a lot of water there. And water means the possibility of life. And so this is where my uh, Mars trilogy comes from, is what you might call a rehydrated Mars, a Mars that could be terraformed into a human space. So there's a good cultural history reflecting well on both the scientists giving us new information, which they always do, the astronomers, but in this case, the science fiction writers responding to the latest news from the sciences to craft a different Mars for each generation. And I would say that there is a, there is a new information since I finished my Mars books that requires yet again a different science fictional view of Mars, that the Mars trilogy is no longer um, um, in, in, in good agreement with what we now know about Mars that we've learned since 1996. So it's now a creature of its moment and no longer the latest news. One last question about Mars and about the, the Mars trilogy. As, as you've already mentioned, of course, terraforming and the notion of terraforming becomes like the central element that organizes a lot of the, of the elements in the trilogy. Terraforming as a science fiction trope, the idea that you can actually engineer on a big scale a planet to make it actually uh, livable for humans, and then humans control the geology of the planet to such an extent that they can turn it and, and, and tame it to their needs. 
Uh, and then suddenly, a few years later, critics and curators and all kind of people start throwing, of course, the ghost of the Anthropocene in terms of terraforming, because as, as soon as we start talking about this notion, the notion that we're in a new geological age where human activity is the driving force of change in the planet, that in a way the, the modern exercise of terraforming was a trope or a mirror uh, or a mental e image for what we were actually doing with Earth. We are, have been terraforming in the sense of turning it into the kind of Earth that we want to be. Uh, something that I find, of course, very important in the trilogy and is that you not, not only you show the technical process of terraforming, not only you show the political positions, but all the ethical and philosophical debates in terms that for different characters, what we do to Mars is not only, of course, a technological uh, this, uh, problem, it's not only a political decision, but there is no way of doing it without taking a moral position in multiple ways. Uh, you have mentioned that maybe at this very same moment, as the landers are arriving on Mars, we're already introducing bacteria in the planet, uh, uh, bacteria from Earth, at the same moment when we're trying to determine if uh, bacteria exist in Mars. And actually that the same project of let's go to Mars with measuring instruments to try to determine if there was ever life there, it's not easy to do without messing with the answer. It's like as soon as we touch things, we instantly may be changing the dynamics that we wanted to measure. So uh, in this second wave, I don't know if we can call it second wave, but in this new wave of Mars explora exploration that we seem to be uh, uh, kicking into gear with perseverance, what do you think are the current or the possible moral and ethical debates of Mars exploration as of right now? in this dimension especially, not only thinking about, about uh, uh, finding life, but also the beginning of a possible process of extraction, you know, and starting to use resources, which seems, that seems to also be on the table. Well, uh, let's uh, focus first on life and mm. then on extraction. Um, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and NASA in the United States have been very concerned to try to not contaminate Mars with earthly bacteria. Now, as a practical matter, you cannot completely sterilize one of these landers, but you can get really quite close. And for instance, the bottles that this lander Perseverance is going to try to scoop up some Martian soil, put them in the bottles, and later on, possibly, this, um, these bottles get rocketed back to Earth for study, although that's, um, that would require some improvements in our ability to come back. But those bottles, they, I'm told by the scientists, are not only, um, they are the cleanest things on Earth. Hmm. There's nothing else on Earth cleaner than the interior of those bottles. And yet there are still some thousands of bacteria on the interior surfaces of the lander that are inevitable and cannot be cleaned off. However, if they were to get onto the Martian surface, the ultraviolet light of sun coming directly to the Martian surface with no atmosphere to break it down is a tremendous sterilizing force. And of course, there's no atmosphere, it's very cold. The bacteria the, the earthly bacteria that is now stranded on Mars, most of it's inside the landers, can't get out. If it does get out, it's going to get killed by UV radiation and by cold. So um, the, if there's living Martian bacteria that is native to the planet, it is probably close to, well, anywhere between 100 meters, but more like a kilometer down, because it would be so much easier to live on water than on ice. And you need to go deep before Mars's internal heat will turn the ice down there into water. So the deeper you go, the friendlier the conditions are for uh, bacteria of the kind that we understand on Earth. Uh, water is just simply easier to live off of than ice. So um, there is a physical barrier between any potential living Martian bacteria, which may have gone extinct uh, three or four billion years ago. So it's entirely hypothetical to begin with, and it's going to be hard 
to find, and it's going to be even harder to disprove that it's there. That will be proving a negative, very difficult indeed, because it would require drilling far beyond what we can do and, and all over the planet. So that we will never know in our lifetimes, and maybe not for centuries, whether there's living Martian life now or not. Meanwhile, our contamination of the surface by earthly bacteria is very small and, and probably insignificant in the larger picture. So that's for life. Now, extraction, we don't need to worry about that. There's nothing on Mars that we don't have on Earth in larger quantities and in better concentrations, such as precious metals. They're on Earth more concentrated because of tectonic plate activity. Mars never had much of a tectonic plate activity. It got cold too fast, the planet itself. So um, what gold, what precious minerals, what uranium there is on Mars is so diffuse, you can't mine it. And then you would have to get it home to Earth, which we don't have a good way to do. So um, Mars has no economic value. And that's one of the reasons that we like it, that we're interested in it. It is a pure interest that has to do with uh, planetary bodies and possibilities, long-term possibilities that are more philosophical. As an economic object, no, um, it's, it's useless to us and will remain that way for centuries. So this is one of the bad science fiction stories that gets told about Mars. And there are many quite bad science fiction stories. And I mean bad in the sense that they deceive us as to the reality of the situation. Uh, after you write the Mars trilogy, you tell the story how do you get a grant for a writer's residency at Antarctica. And actually you travel there and you define this experience as the closest that you're going to find to traveling to Mars. Because of course it's, a, it's an alien, empty world. The feeling in, in, the, in your base in McMurtro, you imagine that it will be very close to the feeling in the first permanent station in, in Mars. But of course you are going to one of the hearts, not the toughest one, which might be the Arctic, but you're going to one of the hearts of the process of transformation that Earth is undergoing throughout this period and in the, in the next few years. Uh, you become, mm. throughout your next series of works, and probably talking about genres and, form, and labels is not very interesting, but one of the main exponents what they call climate fiction, which is understanding that this process of transformation that the planet is going through the weight of climate change and the biodiversity crisis is putting a huge pressure in the transformation of how systems uh, in the planet are interrelated with each other. And it also puts a new weight on our decisions, on our political culture, on the economic model that is uh, uh, f making this process and activating this process and how we need to re relate to each other. So uh, your novels in different ways explore whether in the scenarios of Earth or in the scenarios of exp ex ex space exploration and colonization, our relationship with this damage crumbling earth in a way. So this is why uh, when in 2017 uh, we did an exhibition called After the End of the World that really talked about uh, how to think about the place where we, we were together and, and we made an exhibition that had a very dramatic feel to it. We, we, we were thinking about having like an introductory voice, a, a, in a way a third person narrator that would be setting the tone of how is the world in which we're living today. And, and we couldn't think of a better narrator than Kim Stanley Robinson for being the voice opening the exhibition and you were generous enough and kind enough to, to accept it. So this was uh, the entrance of After the End of the World, the Espresso de la Fidel Monde, the, the previous exhibition that we did in 2017. And you made a piece which was a written poem, an, an oral uh, prose poem called Think of Yourself as a Planet. And I wanted to show a tiny bit of it because it kind of like gives a certain sense of how you were thinking about what is the way in which you need to relate today with time, with this dramatic under process of undergoing transformation that we are experiencing and how do we relate as forms of life with the rest of forms of life in the planet in which we are uh, entangled. So let's listen for a minute. Every moment is strange. You feel this when you look around. Now is stranger than ever. We fly forward at an accelerating rate. History is speeding up. Both catastrophe and utopia are possible from this moment, while the zone between them gets less and less likely. A stark choice, and we're choosing it now, 
by everything we do and don't do. We are the primitives of an unknown civilization. So now, in this strange moment, explore here some aspects of the present, some possible futures. Remember to feel the way you're a jellyfish in the ocean. Feel the way you're a forest, living with everyone else in your body. Think of yourself as the planet. Before moving forward, and I have a lot of things to ask about, there are like two sentences in this piece that I wanted you to comment very fast because one is the title, what does it involve or what does it mean of thinking of yourself as the planet? But also, sometimes you use, there are like sentences that are repeated throughout your production several times. This seems to be like sentences that you are very attached to. And one of them is these ones, we are the primitives of an unknown civilization. So very fast and briefly, what do these two big claims mean to you? What does it involve thinking of yourself as the, as the planet? And what does it involve thinking of yourself as the primitive of an unknown civilization? Um, well, first I want to say thank you to you and to Juan and Sua and to Miguel Nogales and all the people that invited me back in 2017. An incredibly productive time for me um, artistically and intellectually. Um, and so I Thank you deeply for that stimulus and the opportunity to do that, um, that prose poem in, in collaboration with your team. What I notice now is that I was referring to what had struck me back then as revolutionary news from the sciences, that 50% of the DNA in your body is not human DNA. So um, that was news that I think was revolutionary because you can no longer uh, hold to any subject object difference. You are not separate from the planet that you live on. We are all expressions of the planet and the energy flows. And we were whipped up like a, like a dust devil on the desert floor and we spin for a while and then we fall back to the floor and die. Um, but it's a planetary expression, and it, you're living it, like I said, like a forest, like a jellyfish in the ocean. You hold your breath and hold it for as long as you can, and a minute later you have to breathe, and that's the planet keeping you alive. So this was news, or it, it struck me with new force, let's put it that way. Um, and then the other... Well, what's the other phrase? What, we are the primitives I'm, of an unknown civilization. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Now, this is a line from the Japanese poet Nanao Sakaki. And Nanao was a, uh, a Japanese hippie who, after World War II, wandered Japan, and he ran into Gary Snyder, the California Buddhist poet who was one of my teachers and friends. And it's Gary who um, transferred Nanao's line into English and spread Nanao's poetry into English. And of course, it shows that it comes from 1960. I don't believe that we would use the word primitive now. This is not the way to talk about uh, First Peoples cultures. And indeed, maybe it would be good to translate it into the terms we would use now and say that we are indigenous. Hmm. We are indigenous to now, and we are indigenous to Earth. Um, and we are the First Peoples. And the civilization has to improve and get better in the relationship with the biosphere and each other for it to be truly sustainable and just. So um, that unknown civilization, because the, uh, our collective ability to imagine post-capitalism is very weak. So I call it an unknown civilization because when you, as a science fiction writer, when I look to what will be the political economy of, of the year 2312, um, the economists can't tell me, they only analyze capitalism. And the uh, philosophers can't tell me because they're involved too much in the idea of the individual subject. Um, collective civilization and indeed its economics is a strangely blank spot in our intellectual activity. This is what has often brought me back to Mondragon 
the little town just north of Barcelona that runs as a set of nested cooperatives and I think is an example of Catholic liberation theology, which is usually thought of as South American, but existing already in Spain itself uh, because of uh, Father Jose Maria that helped to uh, organize Mondragon in the 30s and 40s and 50s into this um, alternative econo economic system that is one of the very few models that we have on earth today for a modified towards humanist values and towards people power over the power of the rich in a way that is tangibly working. So I, from the Mars Trilogy on, I keep returning to these examples, Mondragon and the, the state of Kerala in India, um, sometimes the city of Bologna in Italy, but these are rather small modeling systems. They're almost like Mars itself, although Mars is entirely hypothetical. And these earthly cities or small states are practical realities in the world today. But the unknown civilization that I referred to in that phrase will have to um, build on these small starts that we see already around the world. The, of course, and, and starting to talk about your last book, uh, the, the idea of being the primitive of an unknown civilization seems to be in itself an example of what we're calling now long-termism. The notion that the scales of political action need to in a way be tuned with the scales of geological time. So you need to recognize that you yourself are part of a, of a temporal process where the impact of your actions may actually have a very long uh, time span. Uh, Something very weird that happens, and I have to like, acknowledge until that you come here in 2017 to participate in the Cosmopolis Literary Festival. And, and we have an interview with you, and we interview you. Uh, this is when we are developing the uh, After the End of the World exhibition. And then we tell you about one of the ideas in the show, that is the idea that maybe we need a political structure that recognizes that those people in the future also have rights, and they might have political rights. So what do you think about this idea? Uh, and then what do you think about this idea? Kim Stanley Robinson, what happens next? <laughs> yeah, well, this was a beautiful uh, visit. I only had three days in Barcelona and I was um, um, jet lagged and a little bit um, feverish, um, which of course now in the pandemic sounds dangerous, but at the time it was probably just a, a sore throat from talking too much in New York. But there I was in Barcelona and the conversations were very intense and provocative. And I remember you and Miguel saying there should be uh, maybe in the world a, a ministry for the future. And I flew then to Amsterdam and then to Berlin and then to London and then back to New York. And I kept thinking a ministry for the future, this is a good idea. And I, I, when I got home and it took a while because it always takes me a while being a novelist I thought, let's use that as the organizing principle for a novel about a best case scenario for the next 30 years. A ministry for the future is perfectly good description of the Paris Agreement. And I have to say the Paris Agreement is the crucial um, historical event of, of our century so far in terms of allowing us to imagine that we might successfully cope with climate change and decarbonize fast enough um, in Barcelona, you have to go down to the beach and look at it and say goodbye. The beaches of the world are doomed. It, and the, a rescue plan for the beaches of the world because sea level rise of even one or two meters would mean their end. And a whole beautiful culture will be drowned. It requires rapid action. So I, I have to thank you and the whole crew there at the CCCB and the whole Barcelona experience. And also, I think you had appointed Timothy Morton, the American philosopher, eco-philosopher, as, um, yep. as your minister for the future for that event. And he is an acquaintance of mine, a friendly uh, uh, presence in my life, uh, and used to live in, in, here in Davis so that we were neighbors. But by the time we got to know each other, he moved to Houston. Um, in any case, he's also a stimulative figure in all of these discussions. So there I had it. And when I got home after I finished my China Moon novel, then I began Ministry for the Future. What I've discovered since is that there's a woman in Wales. She was in the government of Wales and they instituted what they call a Ministry for the Future. Uh, 
yep. already exists as part of the government of Wales. And all over the world, since this book has come out last October, I've discovered that people already had the idea in different forms. They already think that they've been working in a kind of ministry for the future in their various jobs around the world, uh, scientific, bureaucratic, technocratic, diplomatic, all of these people working hard in their various ministries for the future. So um, it's been a, it's been a, it, it's like in the 90s, terraforming Mars was a organizing principle that could bring together all these thoughts that I had. Well, Ministry for the Future was that for these last, um, well, what has it been? Maybe three or four years of, of concentrated effort to try to imagine a good future. So let's talk a little bit about the Ministry for the Future, which also, congratulations, we were speaking before, is your more successful book and maybe your most impactful book maybe since the, since the Mars trilogy. So, so, so congratulations after writing 20 novels, being so much in tune with the times. Uh, I heard some descriptions about what the Ministry of the Fe for the Future is about. One was very striking to me because it's really an incredible sentence. It's, this is a book about what it would be like if we took climate change as a problem seriously, you know? <laughs> like, imagine that we took this thing seriously. So this book is about what would we do then? And also, uh, if we decide to go for it, how does a happy end look like? I, I'm not going to say utopian because there is a lot of suffering involved in the narrative, but unless something that sort of resembles a hopeful end in a way. I don't know if this was kind of your, also your starting question. Let's imagine that we definitely move into action to try to solve this, and let's imagine that there is a path that while being realistic, take us to a place that we may be going to go, going back to your interest in utopian traditions. Uh, what's kind of this like the premise? And do you feel that you kind of like succeeded with the available information at your hand and in the time span that you decided to cover in the book? Um, well, yes, it definitely was my motive. Uh, uh, call it a best case scenario. Um, and maybe you could say that now we are in such a desperate situation in our relationship to the biosphere that a new definition for utopia is simply dodging the mass extinction event that we're beginning now. If we can dodge that and not cause a mass extinction event and not go through a mass human deaths as a side effect of that, that's utopia. So we have a very low bar compared to earlier times when you might talk about perfect societies and so on, which yeah. was always very hypothetical. Now I was just interested in writing a best case scenario. Could we get to a good place from where we are now if we did the right things for the next few decades? That was the challenge that I gave myself and it, you won't be surprised to learn that I came to the realization that the crux of the problem is financial. Yep. When you look at the technologies available to us, they're already invented. So the hardware technologies like solar panels, like um, biofuels, like the various ways that we can de decarbonize fast, battery power, uh, wind power, um, those technologies can be improved, but they already exist. You, we don't need new machinery. We need a new political economy because everybody knows this. Capital only is invested at the highest rate of return. Saving the biosphere is not the highest rate of return in the current system. Therefore, we are doomed. Now, this is just a logical syllogism. And the changeable term is making sure that saving the biosphere is the priority, whether or not it's the highest rate of return in the current system, we need to pay ourselves to do the right work rather than continue to pay ourselves to wreck the biosphere for the, and leave it wrecked for the future generations. So, but okay, we live in neoliberal capitalist global order. It's everywhere. And even China just has a different form of it um, that is the same economy with a different politics. So in that sense, it looks like a horrible problem. And what I did for Ministry of the Future was try to look at things that we could do now in the already existing system that would perhaps flip the valence 
of investment towards biosphere health. And there I came on ideas that are already in the literature and there are some people in economics that are thinking about these things that um, money is a social construct and that money does not have to be given to the private bankers of the world to be invested at the highest rate of return. Money is created by governments and backed by governments by the central banks of these, this world. There's only about 10 big central banks that are responsible for 90% of the money in the world that we really trust. So I am not talking about a cryptocurrency here. And in fact, Bitcoin is a scam that is burning carbon in a re reckless and stupid way. So I'm not talking about private uh, scam currencies. I'm talking about fiat money that governments make. Well, they make it from scratch and quantitative easing, which happened after 2008 and happened last year in 2020, European Union did it, United States did it, China always does it. The creation of money for specific purposes. So now it's being called carbon quantitative easing, that money gets created by governments, by central banks and gets dispersed for sequestering carbon, for not burning carbon or pulling it back out of the atmosphere after that, that money gets exchanged in the ordinary way uh, of that money gets exchanged. But the first spending of it is spent on trying to repair our relationship to the biosphere and to decarbonize really fast. Well, this is the central idea of ministry. And I, uh, my, my characters in my novel are characters like Christine Lagarde or um, Janet Yellen, um, bankers, who are involved at the highest level of policy, getting involved in carbon quantitative easing and then seeing if the many projects that we already know would be good for the planet can be paid for and executed fast enough. And that's more or less the plot of my novel. I have very few minutes left, but, but I can help asking you about some specific aspects that you touch on ministry for the future. And if you could give me like some, kind of quick answers in terms of how do you position yourself regarding these topics. Uh, yeah. The book opens up with a big scale tragedy, a massive heat wave that kills millions of people in India. Uh, in 2020, we had a big scale tragedy that has killed millions of people in the world. Uh, how do you feel about the po potential for political action that big scale tragedies actually exert on the political system on a global scale after, when you were thinking it, about it in the novel? and after we have seen it in 2020? Um, when I was writing the novel in 2019, I thought the rising uh, global average temperatures actually very quickly will hit a level at which it will kill humans, a combination of heat and humidity um, that rarely happens in Spain or in California or any Mediterranean climate, but happens quite often in the tropics and sometimes in the, in the Midwest of the United States, these temperatures kill. And I thought that the nation state where it happened first might take drastic actions, including geoengineering that are um, controversial and even dangerous, but they might do it anyway if the disaster was big enough. Now, the pandemic happened after I finished my book and what I think it has taught people is to read my book as something that is a little more realistic than they might have before the pandemic happened, that it can be universal and that the response can actually be quite rapid. Um, the, uh, the quantitative easing of 2020 was simply to keep the economy from crashing and the world going into a great depression. But we could do the same thing to keep from cooking ourselves by raising global temperatures, by paying for quick decarbonization. So I think that, you know, um, I thought maybe it would make the book irrelevant, the pandemic, I mean. Now I'm believing that actually it accelerated the whole, um, the sequence that I described in the book is happening in the, in the 2030s. I now think it's going to happen in the 2020s. Uh, you touch on something that is very uncomfortable in the book and that I think that most people in the, in the, in the green movement, in the ecological movement, is still very away from, which is the fact that this process in a way requires a political revolution on a scale in reshaping many processes in the world. 
revolutions and violence historically have had a relationship. So actually, as part of the response in your book, violence plays an actual role. There is the notion of eco-terrorism. There is the notion of actually direct political action, which in many cases is not hitting at killing people, but definitely at disrupting the systems of the world in a, in a violent way, in a radically way. Do you think this is a conversation that is unavoidable and that, w uh, that it's definitely eventually going to happen to us? Uh, it seems that this process, it is more and more in a way, so far we come from the big Pacific demonstrations of the Fridays for Future movement in 2019, which were really a turning point in public opinion. How do you think that the role of and the connection between revolutions and violence plays an unavoidable reality in the Green Revolution? Well, I have a lot of fear about this, and I expressed it in the book, because the slow violence of global capitalism, when people are immiserated, when they see their families die, they will be radicalized, and they will be willing to do violence against other humans. It would be better if we were to respond fast enough that that situation doesn't come about. And I'm very interested in these theories of uh, reaping the benefits of a revolution without the necessity of the violence of violent revolution. And so what that means is um, quick legal legislative changes, um, a, a, a political flexibility that um, isn't clear that we have, but it sure would be better if we did manage to marshal it so this would mean paying attention to our scientists. This would mean um, seizing cap private capital for, by governments for the good of the public. It would be emphasizing public over private um, good because private good is, is too confined to a minority. The 1%, we called it in the United States, maybe it's 10%. Uh, but it's a very small minority of humanity that's doing well in the current system. And meanwhile, most people in the biosphere are suffering. Can we change that legally by way of legislation to avoid the violent response? And then lastly, I think it is important to suggest that there is a big moral difference between sabotage, which would be the destruction of private property that burns carbon, and violence against humans, that these are in... Uh, radically distinct moral categories and that um, if pushed to the wall, uh, a certain amount of sabotage might be uh, in order. I think we have time now for questions. Eh, tenemos tiempo para preguntas y no sé si vamos a ir a la sala o vamos a ir a internet. ¿Sí o no? Sí, sí. Tenemos un micro en la sala, imagino, y tenemos preguntas online. Nos veo en absoluto, o sea que si alguno está. <laughs> Leo. Hello, hello. Hi. Yes, okay. I wanted to make a quick comment. Um, so I, I'm Guillermo Anglada. I'm talking tomorrow on the next session on Frontier. It's also about Mars. But I just wanted to let you know, um, Kim, that um, when I was 16 in 1997, uh, I read your book, uh, Red Mars. Um, it inspired me, it was at the point where I started university and that led me to study astrophysics uh, and go into research. And in 2016, these this, this kind of things, a lot of things happened in between, but myself and our team found the nearest exoplanet to the solar system around Proxima Centauri, maybe you know it. So I just wanted to let you know that that was supposed to be the closure of this cycle that started in 97 to meet you and greet you. Uh, in person. It cannot happen, but I hope that it can be fixed in the next few years. Anyway, just wanted to let you know um, that that's also a consequence of nonlinear things that happen because you write a book and people get ideas. Um, along these lines, so assume that going to Mars and colonizing it is going to be inevitable. Assume that. It's just as an hypothesis. So what kind of leaderships we should be allowing to take control of this process when it really starts when we start sending these initial sh starships or ships that go there and build the first bases and then the next people go. Because these leaderships are already emerging. Are these the ones that we want to lead this effort? We should do a, an effort collectively, societally, or let these people do what they do because they have the money to do it, maybe, 
the government should do it, it should be organizations. What's your view on that? Uh, well, thank you very much. I love your story. And um, I have heard from many scientists that the Mars books were an inspiration when they were young. I think that's what science fiction can do in culture. And I quite love it. So thank you for that. Um, as for the first uh, bases on Mars, my entire analogy now is to Antarctica. It's going to be like Antarctica. And Antarctica is an international commons. And nobody has territorial claims there that are uh, recognized because of the Antarctic Treaty of 1959. That was the basis for the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which uh, is now controversial because of uh, private desires to um, exploit resources on the moon and elsewhere. But in any case, the Outer Space Treaty is a good model it should be a commons, it should be international. I mean, this should be no surprise coming from me, but um, society, the um, scientific committee for Antarctic research called SCAR is the government of Antarctica. And it's really just the scientific committees that are appointed by the governments of the 13 signatories and a bunch of uh, supplementary nations. The same thing can be done on Mars and the stations will run the same way. Scientists will go to bases on Mars that will be like McMurdo and the South Pole. And there are another maybe 10 bases around Antarctic shoreline. Um, they'll go there, they'll do some studies. It will be bad for their health. It will be like uh, smoking a pack of cigarettes a day and they will have to live underground most of the time. They'll be very excited. People back on earth will be not that interested I mean, how much do you follow the people at the South Pole right now? Probably not at all. And the same will be true for these bases on Mars. It, people are interested in what we can't do. And that edge of possibility is what makes Mars interesting to us now. Once we're there, it will be about as interesting as Antarctica, maybe a little more. But the scientists will then come home. They'll swap in and out and the bases will grow and they will be an agglomeration of uh, miscellaneous elements, miscellaneous buildings like McMurdo, which looks like a, a funky little Arctic mining town, but with some very high tech laboratories. Mars will be like that. And um, I would say that the private um, expressions of interest in Mars, like we're gonna go there and start our own little town on private money these are fantasies. These are um, compensatory fantasies or power fantasies, like science fiction of the 1930s. It turns out that landing on Mars is much more difficult. Setting up a base there is expensive beyond even the wealth of our most uh, rich billionaires. So uh, recognize fantasies when you see them for what they are. And let's stick with the program of scientific progress and the and space and Mars and the moon as a commons that we all share together. There will be more support for it if the public believes that it's their space rather than uh, been privatized and turned into a fortress mansion. Hello, uh, my name is Livia and I have a question more related to how can we build better futures. So we know that science fiction is a really important tool to bring, uh, to raise awareness and to bring knowledge to people in order to um, develop these better futures. In a sense from cyberpunk to solar punk, I would like to ask you collectively as a society, which narratives should we build in order to improve our relationship with Earth and with others? Well, from my perspective, um, utopian science fiction is the way to go. I would um, urge everybody to read Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed and The Left Hand of Darkness. I would urge everybody to read the Scottish novelist Ian M. Banks and his culture novels. So, or the younger American writer, Cory Doctorow. And you mentioned solar punk. This is the name of a younger generation of science fiction writers that are just beginning and they're trying to differentiate themselves in the marketplace. And um, I think they should use the word utopian um, because I don't like the word 
punk for its political ramifications of uh, nihilism. But in any case, the name doesn't matter. It's the work that matters. The description should be of best case scenarios and of ways forward, things that ordinary people can do. In other words, the bottom up efforts. Ministry for the Future is about uh, international diplomats, but it also has to be about everybody taking care of their own watershed, their own bioregion. Um, Europe, for instance, is in a most extraordinary flourishing of rewilding Europe. And this is a, a concept and a project that is taking place all over Europe to reduce the human impacts and mitigate them by biosphere repair, landscape restoration, and rewilding. You probably already know about it, but uh, more is better. And Spain is actually, and Portugal are famous examples, Iberia, of uh, people moving into the cities and leaving the high plateau alone. Well, this is a great opportunity for a biosphere health to uh, what, what E.O. Wilson called half earth, that, that humans stay away from half of the earth's surface. That is not at all an impossible project in Iberia. It's a, it's a political slash ecological project that it needs no coercion. Young people are moving to the cities for jobs and for other young people so that the great highlands of Iberia are emptying out and the wild creatures are coming back. It's a, it's a what can I say? It's a naturally occurring political process that is, uh, has huge potential for good, for long-term health. So um, these are stories that we need more of. Um, and so I would encourage, especially young people to um, uh, follow these stories and tell them. Que tenim temps de un par de preguntes més, no? Més o menys. Tenim preguntes online? No. Alguien tiene la oportunidad de tener la última palabra. Ahí arriba, ahí dal. <laughs> He's asking that he brought his copy of Red Mars to get it signed. How are we going to do this in these new times? <laughs> CK okay. S. Robinson. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Consider that I don't really see you a lot. So yeah, when I see someone moving with the mic, I understand there's someone who wants the mic. I have a lot of lights on my face. Uh, hello, my name is Alfredo. And I wanted to know, even if um, the, the fact that uh, the, the neo neoliberalism and the current economical system is an obstacle for when facing and uh, the, the challenge of uh, coping with disasters. What do you think of characters such as uh, Elon Musk or Bill Gates about their roles in facing these, these challenges? Um, well, first, as, a, as an American leftist in the eco-socialist tradition, there should be no such thing as billionaires. There should be a cap on wealth that is far lower than that, created by taxation, uh, sharply progressive taxation, which used to exist in post-World War II when we didn't fetishize rich people. And indeed, rich people were considered to be part of the problem in the 30s that led to the mass destruction of World War II. Um, neoliberalism, in part, is the repudiation of that expression of distaste for personal wealth. And we need to get back to that and quit uh, making celebrities out of the rich, which is just part of commodity culture. The idea that somebody's life is more interesting than yours because they're rich and then you spend time and money paying attention to them is, is one of the dysfunctions of our time. 
Now, that said, Elon Musk and Bill Gates are both perfectly ordinary human beings with interests and with desire to do good. Uh, and we should neither make heroes nor villains of them. It's the system that is wrong, not these individual humans who do the best they can with situations that they didn't know were going to occur when they were young. And they've had to catch up to extraordinary wealth that came on them by accident. Um, Elon Musk has a tremendous car company, electric cars. He has formed a tremendous rocket company and makes uh, some of the best rockets on earth uh, in the Falcon and the Falcon Heavy. Uh, these are great achievements, and also they, are, they can become part of a, a greener economy, especially the electrification of cars. So there's a lot of good being done by Elon Musk's desire to do things with his uh, unexpected wealth. Um, on the other hand, his statements about Mars, his philosophical statements about what are important, they're no more valid than yours or mine. And they're distorted, perhaps, by what I would call the Midas touch. King Midas doesn't know the world as well as you and I, because everything he touches turns to gold. And these billionaires suffer from the Midas uh, complex. Um, so um, he has a hobby, which is this Mars vision of his. Well, fine, we all have a hobby. Let him have it. Don't demonize. Don't make him into a hero. The same with Bill Gates, whose projects from his foundation and with his wealth have often done tremendous good in the world. Uh, on the other hand, I would rather that governments were doing that by um, uh, design. And private philanthropy is often a way of dodging taxes and of doing things that aren't as good as the good that would be done by the ordinary political process of legislating these things. So um, this is what I would say about our billionaire class, is let's legislate them out of existence. I sometimes, the short story, like Ministry for the Future is a great title. The story of this process would be called the big haircut. Because in finance, if you, if you are forced to take a loss, it's called a haircut and a big haircut would leave these people wealthy, but not um, in a grotesque and un unwieldy way. So let's all work on this shared story, the big haircut, and go forward as a, as a, as a civilization that has a floor that you can't fall under into misery and has a ceiling that you can't shoot through into the Midas complex. Um, this is one thing about the co-op movement the wage ratio. The wage ratio should be one to 10 and one should be adequacy, uh, a good life, enough. The, the security, uh, the social security of food, water, shelter, clothing, healthcare, education, and electricity. Uh, these are human rights. That floor you should never fall below and that we allow that on this earth is a disgrace. And then the, the ceiling is more permeable. I mean, you don't need more than 10 million US dollars. Um, the, in fact, you don't even need that much. But if you were to allow that as a maximum, then the people who hit that maximum would be perfectly comfortable and happy and they wouldn't be suffering from the Midas touch. So a floor and a ceiling to personal wealth and to corporate wealth as well. Um, these are obvious goals of a decent society. I think we ran out of time. Uh, I wanted to finish today's evening actually reading some of your words because I think it's a way important. Uh, throughout this surreal last 12 months in which we have undergone such a deep sense of transformation, we've all read and heard a lot about how to think about ourselves all the time and, and how to think about our place now and how to think about it towards the future. And personally to me, like one of the things that sum up maybe the spirit of the moment uh, in a stronger way was written or said in an interview by another important intellectual who's also a friend of CCCB, who I've spoken here many times, Judith Butler, who said that in a way the defining war for the 20th century had been freedom, the defining war for the 21st century would be interdependence. And in the text in your 
in the catalog of the exhibition, that you wrote for the catalog of the exhibition, you end up with a segment written in 1994, uh, it is on Blue Mars, in the, in the final volume of the trilogy. Uh, and it's a speech given by one of the first Martians who on a diplomatic mission come back to Earth and visit Earth for the first time uh, as a representative of the Mars society. And this piece of the speech that you have wanted to quote in this text says, that's what it looks like to us on Mars anyway, a long evolution through the centuries towards justice and peace. As people learn more, they understand better their dependence on each other and on their world. On Mars, we have seen that the best way to express this interdependence is to live forgiving in a culture of compassion. Every person free and equal in the sight of all, working together for the good of all. Is that work that makes us most free? No hierarchy is worth acknowledging but this one. The more we give, the greater we become. Now, in the midst of a great flood, spurred by the great flood, we see the flowering of this culture of compassion emerging on both the two walls at once. You end your text saying, I wrote this 27 years ago, and I'll stick with it. I think we all stick with this sentiment, with this spirit. Thank you so much for your friendship and your for complicity once more, Kim Stanley Robinson. Congratulations for the incredible success of the Ministry for the Future. We are waiting for the Spanish edition very soon. Hope that it arrives to 2021. And thank you so much. We are really eager to see you back in Barcelona as soon as possible. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you, Jose Luis, for this and, and for all your colleagues. I, I am really looking forward to uh, celebrating with you all in person in Barcelona in some near future. <laughs> um, not 2021, but maybe 2022 or 2023 at the latest um, we can celebrate in person and that will be a great day. That's nothing that we want more. Thank you so much, Stan. Thank you. Y gracias a tu Tom, me sembla que el, el cicle Mars, la última frontera, continúa de mai. La exposición está abierta todo el cap de semana. Gracias a tu Tom por venir avui.